I see. You found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with experience that's out of this world. And possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world, each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning in to today's episode of The Oracles with James Tyson. It's me, James, and today I want to introduce you to Gregory Possman. He began as a psychic trance channel back in 1991. He went to university at a place called the Universal Brotherhood University, and he holds a master's and PhD in spirituality from that university. He's a proud husband and father of three children, grandfather to seven grandchildren, and he and his wife Sandy live in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Gregory performs workshops throughout the world. His goal is to raise the vibration of the planet by empowering others, which is kind of what we all want to do. We really all want to work in raising that vibration and helping others to kind of flick that switch on in their own lives. Gregory has extensive experience clearing and trapped souls from houses, buildings, and land in partnership with his sister, a gifted medium, Leanne Mason. Souls contact Leanne. Gregory channels the soul and Leanne guides the soul into the light. He also does channeled group workshops and which are available uh, remotely and in person each month and channeled messages are available. And if you go to his website, Gregory Possman, that's P-O-S-S-M-A-N, GregoryPossman.com, there are a number of events that come up and you follow them online. You can also sign up for a newsletter, which I get every month, uh, which is how we kind of communicated back and forth. Gregory actively performs ceremonies, including soul release ceremony, protective shield construction, clearings, baptisms, memorials, and weddings. You can just call him up. Gregory will do pretty well anything. If you've got a crowd, he'll show up and, and help you out. As a psychic channel and teacher, Gregory has traveled the world and has led spiritual journeys to many sacred sites on the planet, including Peru, Mexico, England, Scotland, oh, Iceland, Denmark, Norway. And he and Sandy lead regular journeys through the Blue Ridge Mountains and Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, up where they live. Uh, he's channeled the book Future Vision with information primarily from the Council of Shambhala if I said that right. Uh, Wounded Healers, a reflection of 20 years of tumultuous membership of the Chiron Brotherhood. It's a men's group for male healers and was co-authored by Gregory and five other members of the group. So those are the two books he had out. And now in today's episode, I was going to talk to him about his book, Future Vision, which basically was kind of directed at a spiritual view into the new millennium. Well, what happened was we started chatting and you know me when I start chatting. Basically, we started on how he got into what he's doing. That went into understanding that time that that switch comes on going, oh, I can do this. His name for that, or maybe that is what it's called, is the dark night of the soul where everything just you get into a really low point and all of a sudden, boop. A light comes on and there you are. We talk about the channeling. We talk about um, the soul council or uh, another way of putting it, your spirit guides, your your primary spirit guides. We talk about angelic beings, ETs. We go off on a little bit of a tangent in regards to uh, where the planet is going, how the planet is feeling. And as a result of COVID-19, what the planet is going through and possibly why. I do make a couple of interesting comments in regards regards to those who have passed as a result of COVID and where I see them in the greater picture of where the planet is going and the sacrifices they made so our planet could take a deep breath and relax at this time in our history, our human path, <laughs> let's call it path. So we didn't get to his book, but later this same interview, we do a channeling and an archangel comes through and I was not expecting which archangel i'm not going to tell you but i'm not i wasn't expecting that to happen and uh i i was offered okay you have any questions to this archangel and i was 
gobsmacked. And of course, like an hour later, I, oh yeah, I have an entire book full of questions I'd like to have asked. But unfortunately, we kind of moved through a bit. But that was really interesting because it's the first time I've ever spoken to a channel, somebody who actually channels another being. We didn't know who was going to come through. Of course, you know, he channels the dead. He also channels angels and ETs. So this was rather interesting. And I hope you enjoy how that ends. It's very, very mind stunning, really, for me to uh, have had that opportunity. And I'm still overthinking it. I am still keep running through my mind uh, what I should have asked. So I'm most likely going to end up calling Gregory back and we're going to do some more channeling. And if you ever want a channel session with Gregory Possman, you can definitely get it through his website. Again, GregoryPossman.com, P-O-S-S-M-A-N. He also has on that site a number of downloads for like meditations that he's produced. You can look at the books. Um, he's got online classes. He's also, for those of you who are listening to this before May 30th, 2020, there is a channeled webinar that is on about 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time or New York Time. And you can go to his website and click on that and find out the details in regards to who is being channeled through that. Very interesting gentleman, and let's bring him on now. Gregory, how are you today? I am fantastic. Thank you, James. It is nice uh, to finally get a chance to talk to you because I get your emails every month and uh, and see what you're up to and it's it's been absolutely fascinating. I I'm very very interested in what you've been doing and I always noted that and for those of you playing at home, go to his website gregorypossman.com. That's all one word gregorypossman p o s s m a n dot com, and uh, follow along with us. We're kind of going through the about and all the different uh, things he does, all his modalities and. And the, the the varying, oh man, gosh, you're connected in so many different ways to, we'll call it the other side. You're a spiritual advisor, you're a teacher, you have, uh, and you're a psychic trance channel. How did, how did this all happen? What happened to you as a kid that got you off on this tangent? Well, as a child, people always told me that they came to me and asked questions and I would be able to give them the answers. And... I don't remember that, to be honest. Um, it, it did happen because I do remember talking to a lot of adults, and I always had, the majority of my friends were always older than I. But it really kicked off, I think, when I was around 37, 38. And I believe that we have experiences in our lives that have a tendency to push us to the edge, if you will. And that experience for me was a major unhappiness. I was very unhappy in my life. I had pretty much lost my identity. And I was very successful uh, living the American dream, as we say, had houses and cars and, and making a lot of money and all that sort of thing. And I was miserable. And I proceeded to lose it all. And in the process of losing it all, I had this feeling that God wanted me to do something that I wasn't doing. And I am not a religious person, particularly, though I had been raised in the in the Christian church and pretty much rejected that around 17 or so when it was time for my parents to say, OK, well, we can't control you any longer, so you don't have to go to church. But uh um, and, and I say that with a little bit of amusement. Um, I go in churches and I, and I get down on my knees and pray because I, I feel like that's comfortable to me. And, and people ask me to pray for things that they want. And I do that. Um, but I don't attend church. And um, I kind of feel like the forest is my church and the ocean and natural places, mountaintops. Since I live in North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains, I'm very, very attuned to the mountains, and I love the mountains. I also love the ocean, so it's nice to, to have both. But bottom line is that um, this all started when I was really trying to find myself again. And I went through what I call two years of uh, Dark Night of the Soul, and that is an experience oftentimes it's uh, not very much fun, a lot of depression, and this can be brought on by injuries, illnesses, uh, divorces, separations of loved ones, deaths, 
there's all kinds of ways that this particular process can happen for people. And I imagine some of the people that we're talking to are, are, are going through it now, possibly. Mm-hmm. And again, we call it dark night of the soul. But it lasted for about two years. I basically lost all of my earthly possessions. And, and uh, long story short, I found out that I could channel and I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I thought it was all craziness, and I was very much uh, left-brained and probably didn't have much reality in terms of spirituality in my life. And after that experience, I went to hear a channel. She told me through her the entity that she was channeling that I had decided to do this before I was born, before I got here. And I said, well, that's great. How do I do this? And they said, well, we can't teach you how, but we can certainly help you get the emotional blockages out of the way. And I had not been a very emotional person, but I realized that I had a lot of anger in me. I also had a lot of grief. And I began to have dreams of some of the lifetimes I had led and some of the horrible things I'd done to other people. And... um, So we spent about six months working through all of those emotions, doing a lot of beating of pillows and screaming and things like that. And um, then one day, I believe it was in August of 1991, I actually sat down in what was supposed to be a seance, and I started hearing words in my head, and I started seeing blue energy in my mind, which was very unusual for me. And all of a sudden, about three sentences came forth, and there were three other women in the room, and they got all excited, and they said, you're doing it, you're doing it. And I said, I didn't do anything. I just spoke some words that I heard in my head, and they said, well, you did it. So I was an instant success. It only took me about two years to trust (laughs) what I was doing. And... uh, And there are still times when I'm a touch skeptical, although, again, after 27 years, it's kind of like brushing my teeth. But uh, it's still, it's a great experience. I love doing this. Uh, I hear more of what I channel than I used to. And I think a little bit later on, we'll, we'll do some channeling so your, your listeners, our listeners, can hear what, what it sounds like. Um, it's a great experience. It's a wonderful thing. And um, the reason they call me, I was called a psychic trans channel is because consciously I also find out a lot of things about other people in a sort of kinesthetic way. I'm not clairvoyant. I might be a little bit clairaudient. I sometimes hear things in my head, but most of the time I feel it. And uh, so I feel like I'm, I'm uh, rather kinetic, um, more, more clairsentient than anything when you're talking about these kinds of gifts. And then when I channel, uh, typically I just close my eyes and I feel a bit of pressure around my shoulders and it's sort of like a radio you kind of i feel these frequencies of different entities and sometimes i recognize them immediately and then sometimes i don't so um it's that's that's kind of how it all developed in a nutshell long answer to a short question (laughs) well yeah and it's a, a long answer that continues to be added to you continue to grow through through this it's it's not something that the switch comes on and and you get everything all at once you're still kind of banging against the walls and and expanding your the the technical side of things and and basically like you say you you have your little bit of skepticism so that is constantly being challenged so you are growing constantly yeah yes and and go ahead uh, I, I, no, I was just going to say it's, it's just fascinating. The when you describe it, it it's kind of funny as you're going through what the, the uh, dark night of the soul. <clears throat> mine was in 2012, and mm-hmm. the light got turned on then. I, I, of course, I'm not a channel or anything. I just things were pointed out to me, and I had the aha moment, or what people say could be called an awakening, and understanding all the stuff that I had seen and and heard as a kid was real and what a, what it was uh, or what, what the easiest way of saying it was would be these things I saw were what I thought they were at the time 
but eventually I just kind of blocked mm-hmm. out, you know, uh, a mm-hmm. full body apparition or, you know, something floating in the air kind of thing. But I just kind of put that off because no, that's wasn't what it is. And so many other things came up. Uh, your experience when you said you you were uh, doing a seance and you, you saw the blue this blue energy in your head that's what has been described to me as almost like a third eye awakening too is that huge blue it's it's always blue in their head and mm-hmm. things just come flowing in and uh, so that was fascinating that, that it's it's this is resonating a lot particularly uh for the last I think uh, in the last month, I've talked to a number of very, very uh, well-known psychics and I've interviewed them and they talked to me about their childhood and their childhood was at a varying age, at the age of nine, adults would come to me and ask me questions. And it, it's fascinating. It's, it's like you just hit, you're right exactly with everybody else on that. At the age of, you know, as a child, most of my friends were older or adults would come to me and and ask my counsel basically and it's very that was that was kind of heartwarming when you said that i'm going my god he's one of those two uh, <laughs> I, I didn't have that i you know my but i was very withdrawn i didn't i i wasn't the uh i i, I didn't want to answer the phone like i i i just wanted to be left alone if the phone was ringing and there was nobody in the house it just rang i wouldn't answer it i didn't have the confidence to talk to somebody i didn't want to make a phone call to somebody which was funny. Then I go off to be a, a, a policeman for 28 years and I'm knocking on people's doors and talking to them whether they want to talk to me or not. But it's like it completely changed around. But yeah, it's a very, very interesting um, progression that you've had. And uh, it's fascinating. You you also have and, you know, I'm going to touch on one of these now because it's kind of relevant to what we're, we're kind of getting into is that you offer a number of products. You have a blog. And uh, one of the things that uh, when I bring up your blog, uh, there's a it's called a soul release ceremony. Uh, mm-hmm. guide to releasing spirits and ghosts and this has been something that's um i've always been fascinated with and i uh, a psychic friend and i do this uh she does remote viewing so she'll show up in your house and talk to you know the lady in the blue dress on the top of the stairs and the three of us then myself the client and the the psychic will will talk to the person and find out why they're there and either um get them to cross over 90% of the time we get them to cross over. And if we don't, it's uh, we negotiate a living arrangement. So they're not opening and slamming doors in the middle of the night. Um, when, when you do this, uh, like you in, in, in your blog, you talk about uh, blockages to the earth's ascension or to, um, or go entry into the fifth dimension and beyond um, what do you mean by a blockage to Earth's ascension? Well, let me first say that my sister is a medium, and uh, we work together sometimes, not all the time, but frequently because it's very efficient. Mm-hmm. As you mentioned, the partnership between the lady you work with and, and the client Um being a medium, my sister gets a lot of the information that I don't get. And I can sense the presence of spirits in an area, and I can clear those entities. But the way I do it is I let them speak through me, and then they typically would have a conversation with another human being that I'm with. And so that person would talk them into moving beyond whatever the blockage is, and the blockage typically has been their belief system when they passed out of their physical life. Yes. Let's imagine that they were in the 1700s or the 1800s or even long back, and they believed that they abandoned somebody, they betrayed somebody, they did something that was going to cause God to judge them and flick them into hell or who knows where. But they're not going to make it to the happy place. Let's put it that way. And so they don't cross over. They stay. And and I'm going to say the word trapped, although I don't mean it. They're not trapped. It's their choice to stay. 
But they do that because they feel they're going to be judged or they feel they've been abandoned and someone is going to come and join them, for instance. There's all kinds of reasons, but most of them are self-invoked. In other words, mm -hmm. it's our belief system. And so what we do is we try to talk to them and say, look, you've been forgiven a thousand times. The fact that you murdered your best friend back in the 1700s because you loved his wife or whatever, you know, whatever you did, doesn't make any difference. And that was then and this is now and we're concerned about your well-being. And we find that that's what they need. They need someone to be interested and they need someone to show compassion for them and they need someone to respect whatever they've been through. And then most of the time, they're more than happy to, to, to cross over. The way I envision it is a kind of column of light. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's a sphere of light. And there's always a bunch of very welcoming spirits on the other side sort of waiting for them. Mm -hmm. And when we do this process, they usually go quickly. And then as soon as they go, they're out of my body. So there are two, I'm going to say that there are two sort of channeling experiences I have. One is channeling spirits that I'm very unfamiliar with. And then the other would be channeling spirits or entities of light that I'm very familiar with. When I go into a space and my sister and I are working, and oftentimes we do what you do. We do the remote kind of thing where my sister and I are on a cell phone on the speaker and I'm channeling the entity, and she's actually talking to the entity. So she doesn't have to physically be present, and that's kind of a new development that's been very efficient. And um, so this is not the kind of work that I do a lot, but when I'm in a historical place, it seems like there can be such a, an energy sort of hanging around, and on occasion, it's rare, but on occasion, Someone will call and say, look, we've got an energy hanging out in the house. You mentioned the lady in the blue dress at the top of the stairs. I haven't met her yet, but... but <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I would just... Uh, it was just <laughs> it's not uh, over yet. <laughs> yeah. um, what we found is, uh, well, there, there were f over time, we've figured out there's four reasons why people haven't crossed. A lot of mm -hmm. times it's children, and it's really when the great-grandmother they've never met shows up and says, okay, Billy, come in with me, and they're looking at him like, dude, uh, don't know who you are, I'm waiting for mom and dad. Exactly. And yes. then uh, there's the ones who don't know their dad, uh, an accident, a very quick, something very quick. They're very mixed up. Uh, the ones that uh, perceive they have something like, I can't leave. I, I, I promised so-and-so I'd finish painting the room or mm -hmm. I need to get, I'm the only one who knows how to change the electrical in this building. I can't leave. And then those are the one, the other ones are again, the belief system. I, you know, I coveted my neighbor's wife. I'm not going anywhere because I'm going to burn in hell. And, and we, we found we can, for them, they're actually the easiest ones to cross because if they have a, that, that spark of a Christian belief or, or their religious belief that there is a hell and there is a heaven, then all we have to do is say to them, if Jesus died for your sins, why would you still be punished? And all they have to do is hesitate in their spirit brain. All they have to do is take that breath and go, what? And just as they think about that, 99% of the time, a friend of theirs comes through and says, no, they're telling the truth. You can come. <laughs> and great. because all they have to do is buy, buy that statement, just buy into it for a split second. And mm -hmm. then the light turns back on again because they haven't seen it. It's always there. They just didn't notice. And then we had a, a fellow who died in prison. He murdered somebody and he was in somebody's house and he was make, being a jerk in the house uh, for years. And um, as soon as we said, you know, if Jesus died for years, he was a Roman Catholic, grew up, grew, up, grew up Roman Catholic. If Jesus died for your sins, why would you still be punished? There was a split second where he thought about it and his cellmate came through and said, no, they're telling the truth. You can come. It's all good. And poof, off you went in tears, actually, off he goes. But it's fascinating that they stay. It's, it's um, you know, unless they've got some real mental health problems, they go pretty quick. 
and uh, it's it, I, I love doing that. I love what you're doing, and I love that you're you're moving them over. It drives me crazy these people who put on paranormal events in old psych wards and things where you, anybody can come in with a recorder and you know they're selling beer at the front, and you go in and poke you poke and prod at the dead people who have been were during life were poked and prodded at. And I, you know, I would rather just go in there and just freaking clear everybody out <laughs> when nobody's looking. Do it remotely. Gee, we the place isn't haunted anymore. I don't know what happened. Yes, yeah, because we crossed them over. So they're because they're not circus treats for every every wannabe paranormal investigator. Okay, I just vented. Sorry, Gregory. Um, okay. <laughs> that, yeah, it's uh, breathe. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, so I really appreciate that kind of work. And uh, and your sister, is she younger. Yes, yes, she's about two. Uh, she's older, younger than that. She's probably about four years younger than I. Did you? Did, is this something you got from your mother's side of the family? I think so because my mother was very spiritual, and she was telling me about healers and things like that. And I was very, very reticent. I I didn't want anything to do with any of this, and she was interested in it. Probably. I'm going to say 10 years before I ever even had the experience of the dark night of the soul. So, yes. And interestingly, though, however, my father shared with me that his mother, who lived in northern Indiana, was a healer. And she used to go around, traveled around the state of Indiana with a little vial of sewing oil. And she would ordain people and they would heal. And so there was a bit of this on his side as well. Yes, yeah, so you, you've got a, genetically, you have a double whammy. I think so. I think so. No, that's fascinating. I found when I when I talk to people who are of very high vibration, such as yourself and your sister, I find that our ancestry as a Caucasian person are Welsh, Irish, Scottish, Scandinavian, with a dip into Germany like mm-hmm. down the Black Forest area, or the inside of the boot of Italy, the coast of France, Spain, Portugal, and a bit into Morocco. Um, would that fit into your genetic back or ancestry background? Completely. My father's was German, and on my mother's side, it was Scottish and English, so very much a Celtic kind of yeah. background. So it fits perfectly, and I didn't know that, so that's great. Thank you for sharing that. It's awesome. it's one of those things over after the years I've been doing this and talking to people who are of a higher vibration is that as a Caucasian, that is our Aboriginal background. If we went back 300 years, our ancestors were living with the earth, not mm-hmm. off of the earth, and they understood the power of the elements and the elementals and things like that. That was the Caucasian version of being Aboriginal. Now, of course, Aboriginal populations from North, Central and South America, they only have to go back 150 years, 100 years (laughs) to get those people. So their vibration, a lot of times is percolating at the boiling point. And um, for us, it's been um, kind of pushed back in in Europe as a, a European um, ancient, like five, six, seven, eight hundred years, a thousand years ago in Europe, various portions of the Caucasian, um, that Aboriginal Caucasian side, have been um, suppressed through organized religion or culture, and uh, it was those that Welsh, Irish, Scottish, Scandinavian, German part, and and the inside of the boot and the coast there. That's those are gypsies. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, th- they were the kind of the last of the gypsies. Of course, going back a few thousand years, we're all kind of still talking to the horned, you know, half human, half elk that runs through the forest or something. But um, we were told eventually that they were all demons and, and bad, bad things. And we just pushed it aside. Yeah, so it, it's it's very, very interesting. And again, it's from talking to people like you and talking to people who um, who are of higher vibration. And that's when my little Dark Knight of the Soul thing happened. One of the things I came out of that with, I don't channel, but I can look at somebody in a photograph or in life and go, oh, you're very high vibration. And I can tell them all about themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's my path. I'm supposed to kind of point those out to people turn it on, walk away, and let them let them do their thing. 
But what you do is absolutely fantastic. And again, we just uh, just so my listener who just to, if you just jumped in here, um, go to Gregory's website. He is Gregory Possman, P-O-S-S-M-A-N, Gregory Possman dot com. And look at the number of things that he actually does and his modalities. It's it's fascinating. Uh, you and your sister as a team, do you find uh, you work seamlessly like you don't even have to talk? Like, and sometimes when you're dealing with things, you just kind of, everything just kind of falls into place. When we have focused on what it is we're doing, yes, that's very much the case. Everything seems to happen in a very coordinated way. It's it's synergistic. I don't know another way to describe it. Um, but oftentimes she'll get the hit first and then she'll bring me into it. That's not always true. Sometimes I'll find out about something. Um, we've been clearing Civil War battlefields here in the United States. Brilliant. And, and, and at first I thought, well, that's going to, you know, that's going to be some considerable work. And so what we did was we, I did a channel. There's a couple of free channelings available on the website. It's going to sound like a commercial. And it should. Uh, and it should. I guess. Yeah, good. We'll get people. I would like. I like people to try that. Yeah, yeah. But I channeled the Archangel Michael, and uh, we 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 cleared some Civil War battlefields. And I did a channeling that's free again on the website. People can use that for clearing spaces, locations, cemeteries, whatever it might be. Um, and then when the coronavirus situation arose, my sister said, "Okay, you need to do another channeling." And that will be for all the souls that are, are passing over on this virus situation or from the virus. And it'll be a very a, a different message. So I channeled that one. It's 13 minutes long. And again, it's free. Just look up Archangel Michael and be on there clearing spirits. And she suggested that we do it as a group. And so on April 19th, a Sunday, we did that at 1030 a.m., and she saw a massive number of souls going, as did some of the other people who did it with us. Now, mind you, this is all happening remote. We just picked that time. And then we told people if you wanted to do it a different time because it didn't fit in with your your situation, that was fine. And so a great number of people did it. We don't know how many, but a lot of people downloaded it. And so now there's this opportunity to do locations with larger numbers of people like battlefields and cemeteries uh, we cleared a castle in Sweden and we, we've done uh, uh, in there's a church in Dublin Ireland that I had visited probably 20 20 years ago and I was supposed to clear out the catacombs and never did it we did that remotely with a large group of people so we're finding that it's it's a no time, no space kind of lesson from the other side that says you don't have to physically go there. You can do this at a distance. And it's a matter of just combining everybody's efforts and doing it cooperatively. And it seems to have very, very powerful results. So, again, a long answer to your short question as to whether or not we work synchronistically. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, what I'd be interested in too, maybe you, you may know this, or maybe this is a question for your sister, is that when you are focusing, let's say we're going to go to 123 Main Street in Chicago remotely, and we're going to clear the ghost out of the top of that location, mm -hmm. um, psychically, uh, remotely you show up, and a lot of times, in our case, uh, the psychic Skeeter Wellhouse is a psychic that come who does this. She'll show up and she'll be telling the client who's on the phone. She'll say, okay, I'm at your door. And she can actually describe the house. Like she walks in, describes everything in the house where the person's sitting. And, and she says, okay, there's like nine people at the front door who want to leave to cross. Uh, I've told them to wait outside. I'll cross them when we're, we're done. They seem to show up. They know this is coming in like the great knowledge kind of like they just know when beforehand when we show up that this is going to happen and Absolutely. like the yes. neighbor the neighborhood all the dead people in the neighborhood who've been wandering around lost go hey you know we can go this lady's bringing the white light or whatever it is and they all show up and she says oh, every time she shows up she'll say 
okay, we'll come into the house. We'll use the lady in the blue dress. Oh, you know, the, the client says, there's a lady in a blue dress this year upstairs. Skeeter walks in and says, okay, there's nine people at the front door. I told them to wait outside. <laughs> I came in. Oh, there's four people sitting at your kitchen table. Uh, we can deal with them later. And then we deal with the lady in the blue dress and it falls from there. But it seems like, like when you were talking about the coronavirus, if you have a, a group of a large group of people focused on crossing, you may get a lot of, uh, I, for lack of a better term, lost or lost souls sure. who say, oh, look, the door's open. We're going to go with them. So they'll tag along on the target audience, the target group. Absolutely. And my sister, and her name is Leanne Mason, if anyone out there is interested. I, I, I really like to support her because... And, and Skeeter as well. They're very, very good at what they do. And so as much credit as can be given to them in a very misunderstood kind of, of profession, occupation, gift. It's really a gift, to be honest. Um, that is Leanne's experience as well. Now, since I'm channeling one of them rather than a group, Mine is more to focus on that particular one that's reluctant to go. Mm -hmm. But when Leanne is doing this, she is always working with groups, and she does exactly the same thing. She works in a doctor's office as her primary occupation, and they start showing up outside the door or around her desk or wherever, and she says, not now, I have to work. Uh, we'll deal with this at 5.30 when I'm getting off or whatever. <laughs> you know, but that fascinates me i mean i think it's amazing and you're absolutely right that is her experience and, and she I, will say that that there's one kingpin for instance that i'm focused on maybe but then everybody starts to gather and it's sort of like a 12-step meeting you know here we are what what do we do now and uh we wait we just wait and then she gets to see or sense or feel however it comes to her how many there are and who they are and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. And I love that you guys do that. That is, um, I think, uh, you know, we go back 15 years when all these paranormal TV shows first came out and guys running around with tape recorders and, and poking and prodding at dead people wanting to get pictures. I, there's a television show series right now. It's very popular. I don't think they've ever got a picture of a ghost, but like I, I've gone out on weekends and could get three. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm not going to get into those yahoos, but they, they're, it, they've, dead people aren't a novelty to poke around at. If you have, yeah. Yeah, and since like I think 2011, 2012, um, basically anybody with a tape recorder can stand in the middle of a football field and talk to somebody. Sure. It's like sure. The, ve the veil thinned to that point and hasn't really thickened up, which is a whole other episode. But the um, <laughs> it, it it is very very interesting, and I think it's it's uh, it is something that is important. And uh, for what's you know, and we get into well, we can't on this episode, but we'll get into what's coming. You know, what is coming for mankind in the next few years? But you know, these things have to have to happen. When uh, one of the things you you talk about, uh, and basically you talk about it to the, going to the tunnel or the gateway or, or the light in in these crossings, you talk about uh, the soul council, uh, council of advi uh, advisors. Sometimes we may call them the spirit guides or whatever your term terminology mm -hmm. is. Um, do you deal directly with them at all, or does Leanne deal with them, or is it strictly one on one with the uh, with the dead person? I think that she is probably more familiar with them than I am because she sees their relatives, she sees their guides, she sees or talks to the spirits, and she will oftentimes tell a person, I'm uh, seeing this individual and they're telling me so and so. I think that's more along the lines of her, her gift than it is mine. Okay. Um, in the channeling that I do, they talk about frequently that people have a council, uh, typically, and not limited to this, but 16 to 20 or 19 ent entities who are guiding them through this experience of life, and that when we cross over back to into spirit, into light, whatever you want to say, they basically all show up, and they're there for an entity's life review. 
So Mm -hmm. you, me, anyone else on the planet will go through that process where we find out what lessons we learned while we were here and which ones we didn't. And then they actually talk about what are, what's the next step in the process of our evolution. Yeah. So when we talk about councils like that, that's that's a reference point, I guess, that I would would offer. Yeah, I, uh, I've and I understand they actually change. You'll have a one of the council, one of the spirit guides, one of your guides um, will step out at certain points of your life, and another one will step in and take you through the next uh, whatever the next part of your path is right now i have pan believe it or not uh, <laughs> once called the greek god of the hillside mm-hmm. not not by choice he was just an elemental being on the hillside and, oh now you're calling me a god yeah whatever human <laughs> and then later on christianity came oh now you're calling me a demon you idiots anyway he's <laughs> he's been with me for about a year and a half now and uh, before that, it was a lady with a tricorn hat. It was uh, looked like from the 1700s in in uh, the U.S. But it, she, like my family on my mother's side, goes back to Plymouth in 1628. So who knows? It could have been somebody from back in my my family is on my on that council now. But anyway, she's she was hanging around for the longest time until Pan came in. Um, have you ever had a what is called a well, I guess the easiest term would be a psychic timeout. All of a sudden, everything shut down. Yes, and that happened frequently when I first started doing this. I would find that all of a sudden I was disoriented. I now, now there's okay. There, there are two experiences I can share. One is a complete mental disorientation where I just really did not know where I was and what I was supposed to be doing. The other aspect of that is a period of time that seems like a sabbatical, where I'm more involved in my earthly life than I am doing the spiritual work that I'm typically doing. So those are two distinct, what, what I consider to be timeouts, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I oftentimes tell people, if they get to the point where they're overwhelmed with these things, and they're beginning to question their sanity and their purpose and meaning of life and all that sort of thing, sometimes it's good to take a spiritual sabbatical and just say, okay, I'm going to focus on earth energy, earth life, human life, whatever you want to call it, and I'm just going to stay away from the books and stay away from all the other stuff because we get into this kind of overload where our brain just can't process all of it. It's too much. And so that's when I usually say to people, look, it's fine for you to tell all the entities on the other side, not now I have a headache, you know, not now I'm I'm not interested. Leave me alone because you have that right. You have that ability. And it's, it's oftentimes the people ask me, they say, well, there must be a whole lineup of all these entities on the other side that want to speak for through you i agree yes there are one of my biggest fears when i started was that they would not be there so i'd be sitting in front of a room of people and nobody would show up and they very quickly communicated to me that they're always there so my fear was ridiculous and it was but the point is that at any point in time i could be tired i could be emotionally exhausted i could be upset and i have the right to say no i I, you're not coming through me at this point in time and that's something that i think anybody who does this kind of work and let me say quickly i believe that everybody channels something i believe that you know it could be art it could be music it could be entities it could be psychic information but i believe that all of us have the ability to do something along these lines albeit differently and distinctly and individually in our own way so i i think it's funny when people ask me well can you teach people how to channel i usually respond the same way say i can help you get the blocks out of the way but the way you do this is probably different than the way i do it because we're all unique we're all individuals we all have different gifts so yes yeah i think and we all i think in the great scheme of things we all come with a different piece of the puzzle absolutely if we all had the same piece it would be kind of 
uh, counterproductive. We're not going to move forward. But we all show up to the game with a specific playing piece. Where we occupy a certain character or we're a, a, an individual piece on the chessboard. We all have our purpose. And that's why some people... Uh, I can only see this thing or I only deal with this kind of entity or I can, you know, in the psychic community, they all have their own modality based and, and are really good at it because in the great scheme of things, it covers everybody's covered, but an individual is only good for this. And a lot of times people will say, well, I really, maybe I've never been to a psychic before. I've never actually had anything like this. Uh, maybe I should do it. And then, you know, which psychic should I go to? Well, you know, pick one because the one you pick is the right one. But right, I'm not right. I'm not going to I can give you a list or I can say if one comes to mind, that's probably the one you're supposed to go see. But it's mm -hmm. it's not like everybody, you know, I don't believe in these psychic things. Maybe I'll go try it. it or people who uh, do psychic shopping, they they'll go to a psychic didn't get the information that they were looking for, so go to another psychic, go to another psychic, and go to another psychic. But I don't, I don't believe in psychics because they never tell me the truth. Well, smart up. Uh, maybe it's just not your time, or you're, you just need to be hit over the head with a hammer psychically. Me venting again. Sorry. The uh, your your work on battlefields is fascinating. I was at Gettysburg, and um, brought home by accident because there's me not clearing myself when I leave, yes. um, a 17-year-old mm -hmm. who died in day two of the battle who basically wanted to come home with me to see the boats on the coast. And at the time, my daughter was 17. So he also was fascinated with my daughter and the refrigerator. <laughs> Every time we opened the refrigerator, he came up and he was looking at it. I, I've been told. I never saw him, but I had multiple psychics saying, you brought a kid home with you and, you know... Anyway, he ended up, what was fascinating about him was he connected to me, he attached to me and came home, but he went back in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. He went from Vancouver, British Columbia on the west coast of Canada back to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in a breath, mm -hmm. but he connected to me to come here. How does, do you have, I don't know how that works. It's, um, he just, and he went back because that's where his people were and they were st he said they were still fighting mm -hmm. and they needed him so mm -hmm. it's like in your experience are when you in in your mind's eye look at those battlefields is the battle still raging for some of them for some it is in other words they don't know that the war is over they don't know that they have left um let me answer your question about him specifically you have a 17-year-old daughter. You have a 17-year-old who died at that age. And you have a refrigerator. And as soon as you said refrigerator, I thought, man, teenagers, they're always hungry. Yeah. And, and then you have the element of what do people eat in this realm, in this time frame, that we didn't have to eat way back when? So, and I'm going to draw another analogy, and it's, probably doesn't sound related, but it is. I hate antique stores. <laughs> antique stores are like a bank of ghosts and spirits. And, I'm, and it, this is an indirect answer to your question. Why? Because they love these old antiquities, these old items that they can, they can recognize, they can hang out with them. It doesn't matter if it's one that you actually that they actually encountered in their life they may have encountered something very much like it and they think oh that's familiar so they go into antique stores and they stay there and that's one of the reasons i don't go because if i go in there all of a sudden i could have three four hours of work to do in terms of crossing them over and many of them don't want to go yet they're not ready they don't want to go They've just found a great place that they're comfortable with. Well, your young 17-year-old spirit hit on your energy when you went to Gettysburg and thought, wow, there's a lot I can learn from this man. So I'm going to go back to Vancouver with him and find out whatever it is that I want to find out. 
Now, given that there's no time and no space on their side, as you said, in a breath, he can return to Gettysburg, be back where he thinks he needs to be, so he's not abandoning his brothers in arms, so to speak. But there is no battle. In this dimension, there's no battle. And that brings up another interesting point, and I imagine when they do these these uh, retroactive reenactments where these guys go and they dress up like the Civil War or they dress up like the Revolutionary War or in the case of Europe, uh, they reenact Viking installations, trading places, things of that nature. They are actually missing those lifetimes that they've been in to the point where they're trying to recreate them. And according to the entities that I've channeled, that is a very dangerous thing to do. Because if they are, they being the human beings that are reenacting this stuff, if they are so unhappy with their life here, they can literally decide to cross over that timeline and jump back into that period of time. So yes, it still exists, it's still ongoing for those who choose to focus and concentrate on it, and the process of going back there is not really that difficult. However, you're not going to learn anything by doing that. In other words, our presence in this reality is perfect. This is where we're supposed to be. And believe it or not, we chose to be here. We're volunteers. We're not victims. Many of us think, you know, I've got this crappy life. I don't want to be in it. I hate my wife. I hate my whatever, my job, my my life. Well, they say on the other side, we created it. And we created it in order to learn. So he came to Vancouver for a brief visit so he could learn. And then once he'd learned what he needed to know, he goes back, back to a place that he's comfortable with, not necessarily what his soul wants, but where he wants and needs to be so that he's not leaving all those people behind. He's not, uh, what do I want to say? He's, he's, he's fulfilling his obligation in his belief system. Of, co- of course, that obligation is done. It's long gone. It's over with from our perspective. But in his way of seeing things, he's back where he needs to be. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's amazing. Um, yeah, uh, your work on battlefields would be uh, incredible. Uh, not only the Civil War and, and Revolutionary War battlefields that you would bump into where you live and the, and the Indian, uh, various Indian bands or tribes, you'd call them uh, fighting amongst themselves going back a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've always, you know, I, I keep thinking of, I think back to these people who have farms in Belgium where there are still people uh, from the First World War coming up out of the trenches mm-hmm. over mm-hmm. the top and fading into the in the mist. And they go, oh, yeah, that, that happens all the time. Don't worry about that. I go, Dude, you're living on a battlefield. Thousands of people died here. He goes, yeah, but, you know, it makes you we grow good crops. Um, it's, <laughs> it's like cross those people over. Uh, a lot of them are just residual energy, though, so it's not a, an actual ghost. But it, those places just be they'd be wandering lost on, 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 in places like that. It would drive me crazy living in a place like that. Um, it's you're channeling oh the other thing just just so you know uh your mother i think that's her standing to your left is that correct i would imagine so yeah okay good <laughs> he's been, um he's been around for a lot, the last couple of, of well last few days anyway yeah she's that's goosebumps on your left arm yeah 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 sure. anyway that just came through um it's yeah it's this weird thing i do uh it's yeah i've been seeing them for the last couple of years and that's it's kind of where my ability has kind of gone i used to see ghosts now i just see volunteers that come in who have already crossed over who come back and you know like you're saying you're um the uh the council the soul council of advisors the spirit guides uh we have these human relatives of ours come in and they're like the in-betweens they can uh so the spirit guide or the council doesn't have to 
really reach down to get our attention and it's like say don't turn left you go over a cliff and give you the goosebumps and the hair on the back of your neck mm-hmm. it comes through our that volunteer human that is there with us so it's kind of cool anyway enough about you let's talk about you uh the, <laughs> the channeling when you channel who is it you actually channel i've heard people channel um you know the king of syria or something or these ancient beings and things like that do you you actual your channeling is is more the past relative or if somebody wanting to come through and pass on some information is that the type of of being that you uh, traditionally channel or are you one of those ones that that go back to ancient Greek, uh, Egypt and do that kind of thing? The majority of entities I channel are uh, uh, angelic beings, extraterrestrials, um, uh, very high frequency entities and i don't want to sound egotistical when i say that i don't mean that they feel like for instance kuan yin um entities that have a a tremendous amount of wisdom very powerful abilities when it comes to healing also i'm going to say very uh, tremendous vast amounts of information Uh, There are probably 40 different entities that I channel, um, and I oftentimes don't know who's coming through, but it oftentimes is influenced by the person who I'm channeling for, the group that I'm channeling for, or the information that needs to come through. And so what I've noticed is the, the expert in the particular area that we are challenged with is usually the one that comes through. And sometimes it's not always as easy to figure out who that is as it might be. And a lot of times there, you mentioned Pan. I have channeled Pan. Pan is in my, what I feel when Pan comes through is this incredible earthy kind of lightness, uh, almost playful in a way and very, very wise. Um, I don't know how else to describe it, but they they all have a different feeling. They all have a different vibration, a different in- energy. And so, um, and then there are some, for instance, at Stonehenge, there are four guardians of Stonehenge. And whenever I've gone to Stonehenge, I've always channeled at least one or two of them. That's the only place that I've channeled them. And so some of them seem to be aligned with certain earth places. And and I would not imagine that they would come through any other place. I could be wrong. Um, You know, I certainly wouldn't want to place any limitations on them because they don't have any. But that's been my experience. So... I don't know if that answers the question, but oh, no, yeah. I, t- typically, if people call me and they say, I'd like for you to channel my dead aunt or, you know, somebody, my son who passed away two years ago, that's not my specialty. I don't do that well. Um, then I would send them to my sister and say, OK, Leanne can tune into them and she can give you information that they have to share with you. Uh, she gets lots of that information and she's excellent at that. But it's sort of like you're asking a carpenter to do an electrician's work, and that doesn't work. So in my case, if it's something, uh, witches, curses, things of that nature, I usually recommend people to someone else who's got a better bearing with that than I do. Um, If it's not something I think intuitively I can handle, then I usually tell people right away, I can look for, I can recommend but I'm not the right one to help you in this case. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that's and that's that's how you can tell somebody's real. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we have. It's to- like, yeah, if if you if you get a psychic or a uh, uh, a intuitive that turns you down, then mm-hmm. you know that person's legitimate. They go, oh yeah, I can talk to your dog. Sure, 
uh, come on in. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, no, you, no, 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 no. <laughs> now, you have channeled webinars. You have one coming up May 30th. Now, for those of right. you listening to this after May 30th, these come up quite a lot. So if you please uh, keep checking the website. Or you have uh, an email that goes out that I get. Yes. Yes, I do a newsletter every month. Uh, People can go to the website. You can sign up for it for free. You can easily unsubscribe if it's not your cup of tea. Um, I'm not interested in selling you Amway products or any Mm. kind of... (laughs) I'll get in trouble for this, but uh, there's nothing... There's no junk that goes out. There's no spam. And we do not share our email list with anybody. So if you sign up, it's secure. Uh, you will get an email every month. I do a free channeling every month. That is a video that's typically up on the website. It's on the home page. You can go watch that in five minutes if you want to without signing up. But if you do sign up uh, uh, there, then you have an account, so to speak. And um, I have uh, usually try to get it out on the, the end of the month or the first day of the month. Sometimes it's a day or two later if I'm traveling, but uh, typically it's it's pretty consistent. And I put things in there, what I'm doing and webinars and listings of new products and things like that. And uh, then if we have a clearing that we're going to do, I always put a listing in there as to what it is and where you can download the information to get the channeling that we're going to use for that process. Brilliant. This one on the, tw- on the May 30th, it goes from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, New York Time. That's correct. Um, and you are, uh, part of the description is you're dealing, you're channeling, uh, is it Jalil? Jalil? Halil is how I Halil. pronounce it. Hal- Halil, Kronos, Metatron, Ascara, Mera, and the ancient days uh, for this channel, uh, and the ancient of ancient days. Of days ancient of days, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the 72 names of God, and I'm very cautious about that because people then ask, well, are you really channeling God? Yeah. I, I, you know, that's that's a tough question. I, I believe so, but... I'm not Neil Donald Walsh. I don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a way to find out, but we don't want to die. Um, <laughs> people, so in this kind of community, this woo-woo community of ours, where people yes. say, "Well, how how am I going to know for sure?" Well, not in this life. <laughs> it's like you're going to have to move on. You're going to get that aha moment, but uh, it's when the when you hear that beep on the heart monitor, um, then it's like, oh, that's what he meant. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I think uh, Kronos. He's from. He's one of my people, but I'm not sure. Allegedly. Yeah. Well, Kronos uh, calls himself the spiritual commander of the Syrians, and yeah. Kronos is. I'm going to say a very humble being, also a very very intelligent being, and I believe that the Syrians are very much involved in our future. And I believe that the, one of the things that they have to offer is the kind of technology that will help us actually turn back the clock, if you will, on toxins and ecology and things of that nature. And, of course, the first question people ask is, well, how come you don't unleash it now? Why don't you just fix it? And the truth is they say that we have so many people on this planet who are power mongers, um, selfish, want to control other people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're not going to unleash that technology until they know that it won't be used for anything but the most benevolent purposes. Yeah. So when that happens, I believe that a lot of these issues and challenges that we have on the earth are absolutely going to be solved. People may think I'm crazy because I believe that, but if I didn't believe that, I'd be working for IBM or I'd be doing something entirely different. Yeah. So what I'm going to say is it takes a lot of faith in this process to stay in this process. Uh, when we look out there in the world and see all the things going on that are going on, it's kind of like, is the cup half empty or half full? Which side am I going to focus on? And again, a lot of people probably hear me speak and say, You're just nuts. I mean, the world is going to hell in a handbasket no matter what you do or say. 
Well, we live on a lot of different levels, and you can, you know, you of all people can really understand that. Uh, when people start looking out of the side of their eyes and see things that aren't there, they are literally looking into another dimension. Mm-hmm. And when they turn their head real quickly to see if it's there and it's not, it doesn't mean they didn't see it. It just means that they can't see it if they're looking straight at it. So our peripheral vision is one of those pieces um, that get us, uh, I'm going to call it a barometer, it lets us know that we are actually tuning into something that isn't in this dimension. Uh, those goosebumps that you mentioned earlier, the hair raising on the back of your head, that's telling you something. That's a barometer. Uh, those chills that go up the spine, all of those things are ways that our physical body warns us that something is going on or alerts us. It doesn't even have to be a warning. So... You know, my feeling is that our dreams, the traveling that we do at night, the gifts that we actually pay attention to, uh, when I channel, I hear them say, oftentimes you have to take this into your heart and determine if it's real for you. uh, And if it's not, forget about it. You know, it's not for you. If, If you can't or don't want to accept it, That doesn't mean it's good, bad, or indifferent. It just means that it's not for you. And uh, why would you come back? You know, it's sort of like ice cream. You like vanilla or you like chocolate? Well, I like chocolate. Well, why do you like chocolate? I don't know why. I just do. Okay, that's great. That's a great Mm -hmm. test. So if this kind of information feels good, if it feels right, if it feels good in your heart and you like it, then you continue to pursue it. And if it doesn't, if it sounds craziness, maybe universal timing isn't right for this in your life. Maybe it's time to say, okay, back to the six o'clock news or you know whatever other aspect is right for you. And that's kind of how I explain it to people. You know, it's not for everybody. And uh, in the beginning, when I first started, I thought, wow, this is amazing. And everybody should have access to this information. And I want to share it with the whole world. The world doesn't work that way. The world, the whole world isn't ready for some of these things that we're talking about. But some are, and that's who we focus on. (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, I get, like I say, sometimes I see somebody standing beside the person I'm looking at Mm -hmm. and I don't hear from that person. I usually get hand signals or I get a full download of a sentence or something, but I don't quote unquote hear anything. And the lady beside you is doing the thing that is, it's a signal. It's a sign. She's got like a bag, a shoulder bag uh, that you would have used to plant seeds. Mm -hmm. So what she's doing is she's showing me, her hand in the bag scattering seeds and that is you Mm -hmm. you are every time you think of those seeds that she's throwing out every one of those seeds lands on the top of a person's head Mm -hmm. and it's turning them on and that is one of your um that is that is your part of your path that isn't Mm -hmm. all your path but that is a big part of your path to touch other people and mm-hmm. flick that switch on. Basically, it, it's whatever you've planted the seed or the seed is with that person. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the way things go, it's up to them to carry that on and germinate it. And then that free will gets in the way. But um, but your job was to hand them the seed. So that's what she showed me then. So it was that that makes sense for what you do going out. And whether you buy into it or not, it's up to you. I'm just showing you that this is this is what it is. And that's what she did in her life. She planted tons of seeds with lots oh. of people. So, you know, confirmation can be a wonderful thing. And you're absolutely describing the nature of my mother. She planted a lot of seeds and she didn't judge people at all that I can remember. I mean, she was very judgmental, but the people that wanted to take advantage of what she had to offer, she had no judgment whatsoever of them. 
and I, I've inherited that judgmental side. You know, it's it's I have to be very careful. Uh, one of the things that we are, my wife and I are both ordained ministers with Universal Brotherhood. We have a wedding business here in North Carolina, which is the home of a lot of destination weddings. And I have to be very, very careful about not being judgmental of people's beliefs and being very open to everything that they believe in. Uh, so that has been a challenge in my life. And being in this kind of work is almost ironic because the last thing I can be is judgmental when it comes to the people that come to me for help. And I find myself helping a lot of people that are very sensitive. And I'm not nearly as sensitive as they are. And so I have to be careful when they, they describe things and they tell me about them. I mean, you know, a lot of people, one of the things that happens for us in our spiritual path, I believe, is that we come across people with different gifts. And then we think, oh, gee, I wish I could do that. You know, that's so neat. Uh, I am not at all clairaudient or I mean clairsentient. I am clairsentient. I'm not clairvoyant. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I feel, but I don't see. And I'm just so jealous of people that are clair, uh, clairvoyant, that can see. Because I think to myself, man, I, I, I want to see what they're seeing. I want to see what my sister sees. I want to see what you see. But that is not my gift. And that jealousy is a form of distraction. It's just, it takes my energy away from what I can do and what I'm supposed to be doing. And a, a very quick analogy, think about a chess player. And the chess player is moving the pieces around on the board. And we, the human beings, are the piece and our soul is the one that's moving us. Mm -hmm. And we don't know, we don't know, you know, we want to believe that we have free will and the ability to choose. But at the same time, our soul is saying, no, nope, no, nope, you're going to go this way. You're going to go that way. You're going to bring a 17 year old home to Vancouver who doesn't even, you know, isn't even physical. Um, well, wait a minute. Did I sign up for that? Was that a choice? Was that a decision? No, but it's an experience that you need to have, so you're going to have it. Uh, what about this cancer that I got going on in my body? What's the deal on that? Why do some people get it and some people don't? And your soul says, well, what's the lesson you need to learn from this cancer? What is it teaching you? Is it teaching you that you need to open up to the love of lots of other people, that you need to allow yourself to be supported is it teaching you that you don't have to be sick to be loved? What's the lesson here? Why did I create this condition in my physical body? How, why is it that everybody has cancer cells in their body, but not everybody gets cancer? How does that work? Well, that's not necessarily my teacher. I'm not supposed to learn from cancer, and therefore I don't get it. But many people do. Why does a child who's seven, eight years old, why does he have terminal cancer? Where's the perfection in that? And once we get that it's all perfect and that we're creating it or our soul is creating it, all of a sudden it all starts to make a little bit more sense and it increases the faith that we can have in this process if we can accept what's going on and I've come to believe I don't need to understand it I just need to accept it that is so much more important than my understanding it and in the and just to take that deep breath and exhale and say I accept mm -hmm. is very freeing freeing it's very it, it it's basically all the burden drops and I look at you're, you're talking about you and your wedding, your, your destination wedding or the wedding business and you mm -hmm. having to be conscious of how you actually identify that you're judging people and you have to take totally. that breath. 
I can, this is me being that, this is my Mount, Royal Canadian Mount of Police brand, looking at it from the outside saying, and what is that doing for you? That is teaching you. That is mm-hmm. one of the lessons that you are learning is how to manage judgment. Mm-hmm. So it's don't ever look at it as, oh, you know, my prejudging or my judging being, this is a really bad thing. It's not a bad thing. You've no. identified it. And now as you've identified it, you're realizing you have control over it. Take a deep breath and go, oh, okay. I don't have to do that. So it was give that, that uh, effect that, that other people's belief systems or whatever has on you to allow you to judge them or make you judge them is the piece that's being handed to you to have to learn how to deal with. And that Absolutely. happens to be at this point in your path. So deep breath, let it go. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, all fascinating. Good. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, this is one of those conversations that, you know, I would sit with a beer on a, a porch on a sunny day and this would take like six hours. We would just yeah, <laughs> chat about stuff like this. This would, this would be cool. Um, but I don't want to tie you up all day. Uh, the, the, uh, and again, too, I think I don't know if we really got got or if I, I mentioned this enough, but please go to uh, Gregory Postman dot com. Uh, look at the events. The channeled webinar, May 30th at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. New York time. Uh, you can click on the details. You can find out a little bit more about that and uh, and find out all the other stuff that he's up to. I did actually at one point uh, want people to come in and we would talk about uh, your last year, your, your book uh, the future vision a spiritual guide to the new millennium but i think i'm gonna have to have you back and talk about that because that's uh, a whole other thing um one of the things i wanted to point out you were talking about um the earth itself and uh, you know there are things that will come where we're all going to have to get our collective poop together and start uh, helping you know repair the damage we've made and there are things out there mechanisms that uh, will help us but you know the virus itself this Mm -hmm. covid thing Mm -hmm. it's really given the planet a breather absolutely it's it's a you know for the and this is this is a horrible thing just for me to say and i'm going to get crap for it but with the amount of good it's done for the planet compared to the amount of people that have actually passed Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's not like we're going to have to wait for the reptilians to come down and start harvesting us, harvesting us for food in a couple of years to get rid of a lot of the low vibration people. We are, uh, you know, there are people and I'm not calling them low vibration people who have passed, but it was their time, I guess, their sacrifice for the greater good of the planet. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Or am I, I going to get shit for that? Oh no! Well, <laughs> probably will, but <laughs> yeah. But not for me. Um, I agree. I think that a number, so many people, and and let me first say that I feel for anybody whose parent, grandparent, great grandparent, oh, yeah. whatever, whatever your relative, loved one, friend, whatever, whoever may have passed. As a result of this process, nothing takes away the pain of that. I mean, we're human and we have emotions and and that's challenging and difficult. So I feel for those people who have lost people. I was given a description of people being dropped off at the hospital and and their relatives literally never seeing them again. Uh, They can't go in the hospital and be with them and then they pass over. They make their transition and... I mean, my gosh, what a what a thing to live with. But at the same time, my feeling is that a lot of people have used this virus as an instrument to make their transition. And let me say immediately after that, that time and time again, those on the other side have come through me and said, look, death is your way of describing it. But there is no death. It's a transition Mm -hmm. and it's a crossing point. It's just something that's taking you into a different and new experience. I'm not asking anybody to believe that. You know, everybody has their own creed, real realization, belief about what's going to happen on the other side. Um, and and I will say that knowing that from from my perspective and having spoken that so many times, listening to it being said from the other side, that is my belief. 
And because it is my belief, when it's my time to go, I need to look forward to it. I need to celebrate it. I need to see it as a, a new way to, 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 to be. So, uh, but at the same time, the, the feeling that I have is that the virus is actually helping us increase the vibrational frequency of the planet. Yes. A lot of people that are not necessarily aware, awake, and again, I don't mean to sound judgmental, but a lot of people are using it as their way of going. And many of them, as, as the statistics will show, had COPD, they've had diabetes, they've had respiratory issues. Uh, a 30-year-old who's relatively healthy gets the virus, and 14 days later, he's fine. A 66-year-old like me gets it. I don't have that I know of too many health issues at all, but it's a whole different, you know, it's a whole different deal for those of us that are older. Mm -hmm. So, um, which explains to me why I go in the grocery store and everybody my age has a mask on and everybody that's younger is walking around with no mask and no gloves. And that's okay too. You know, that's, that's up to them. That's their choice. So I think that the virus has made a huge, a huge difference on the planet. I think that all of the things that are happening, um, the oceans clearing up, they say in Venice, you can actually see to the bottom of the canals. And, yeah, and dolphins have come back into, the, into coming, the canals. Swimming in there. I mean, that's amazing. That's incredible stuff. It's so, I, I yeah. this, is, uh, this is one of those controversial things I'm going to get dumped on, too, for saying. But I look at the people who have passed of COVID like almost as those who passed in a just battle for mm -hmm. a good cause. Mm -hmm. uh, those soldiers that fought against tyranny and and passed in battle, they gave their life for a greater good. Mm -hmm. I and and the only way for people to realize, oh, we have to shut everything down and isolate or pull back and give this earth a breather is there had to be a visible consequence. Absolutely. If people only got sick, then no one would really care. That's right. If people actually died and somebody knew somebody who knew somebody whose grandfather died, it's like, oh, crap, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe I should stay home and work from home. Mm -hmm. When we come out of this, it, it'll be interesting. Uh, I know up in Canada here, the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC uh, News Network, they had a, a, a story about people who probably wouldn't go back to work. They've been working from home for eight weeks and there's no need. They realize there are realizing the only need for them to be at work was the social aspect of a new peer group that mm -hmm. they could leave home, not only work, but had some kind of social aspect and then come back home and have their family. But they're realizing they didn't really need that anymore. They could do work from home Absolutely. and you know, walk away, get out and go for a walk uh, on their lunch hour or take two hours off instead, instead of having somebody looking over the shoulder uh, with a stopwatch, it's far more relaxing. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how after I call the apocalypse mm -hmm. <laughs> post apocalypse, we're going to see people um, with new ways of doing what they've always done, new jobs, um, new ways of uh, interpersonal communication and things like that. It's going to be interesting to see how this is going to kick in. Um, yeah, I, I only wish I would have bought Zoom stock in Zoom about six, eight weeks ago because uh, that, you know, the amount of people that are using Zoom and Skype and the various other ways of connecting has just skyrocketed. And your your comment about people continuing to work at home, how much less stress are they going through when they're not fighting traffic. Um, I work at home and I live in the country, so a commute is almost an alien thing to me. But yeah. people who don't have to do that anymore, the amount of gasoline, the exhaust, the carbon footprint, as we call it, all of those things are incredibly, going. they're gonna be so different. Uh, yeah. And I think the break that that gives to the planet is amazing uh, in the channelings that I've done they've talked about you don't have nearly the amount of artificial energy lying over a city that you had in the past 
Uh, you think about air quality, you think about uh, just, again, the stress of not having to get in that vehicle or drive or go catch the train or however one got to work. It's amazing. And then their kids, I mean, they're less stressed as parents. Their kids are going to pick up on that and they're going to say, wow, you know, what's happened to mom and dad? Conversely, the ones that are together 24-7 and are living what we call parallel lives where they're not really so much in love with one another, that could be a problem. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I did a bit of a little video thing for uh, social media and I was talking about, uh, and this is me as a policeman reflecting, uh, remember those people who are in poor, like you say, poor domestic situations or abusive situations where that the, the mother had a break eight to ten hours a day when the abuser went to work. Exactly. That abuser isn't going to work anymore. So I was kind of saying the two places, if you got a couple of bucks and wanted to uh, make a donation locally, your, your women's shelter and your food bank. Absolutely. Uh, the yeah. invisible people. And, um, and a lot of people don't understand that. Like, as a policeman, I understand, like, domestic violence isn't, well, it's, for one thing, it's not always man on woman, but uh, there is, um, those people are trapped. They're trapped in something they can't get out of. So, you know, think about that, especially if you have a friend who's in a situation like that. Reach out to them and just know that there's, uh, you're thinking of them. But, I think, oh. that, yeah, I think that the, the, the wake up call, the two cosmic two by four, if you will, of this particular pandemic virus, whatever you want to call it, it is it is extensive. I mean, the collective is being forced to look at itself. And, you know, for me, I came back from Europe around the first of April. And so I've been basically sequestered for, I'm going to say, around six weeks. And the things that I've I'm finding is that a lot of the distractions that I used to be able to use, they're not working anymore. And I have to look inside. I have to go inside. I have to get quiet. Um, and I'll make a confession. I don't usually listen to the monthly message that I channel. And people say, oh, my, why don't you listen to it? Well, this is what I do. And I, you know, I, I do it a lot. And I just don't make time. Yesterday, I listened to the monthly message, and it was about going inside and seeing the light that's in there and giving me an opportunity to just be more peaceful. And it worked. It, it actually worked. And I thought, wow, I would never have done this if I could go engage in all the distractions that I typically do. So this is an opportunity. I mean, it's an incredible opportunity for people to look at their spiritual side and recognize what they have to be grateful for in their family and loved ones. And it's amazing. I mean, it's just incredible what, what, what the, the benefit that come, can come out of this. And I agree with you 110%. I am very, very, I, I've got so much to be grateful for. I mean, I'm not experiencing financial loss and I'm not experiencing a loss of much of anything other than just a little bit of my freedom. And the truth of the matter is there are so many out there that are suffering from so much in this process. And I said to a friend yesterday, I said, man, I cannot believe if I were a, a man with a family of four or five or six and, uh, and I lost my job and didn't know where the next dollar was coming from. I, I just can't imagine the pressure that brings to bear. But the truth of the matter is, it is an opportunity. And I think about the Chinese language where the word for problem and the word for opportunity are one and the same. And that may sound a little bit harsh, but I think that we as a race have to unify or we die. We, we yeah. get away from our differences and we get out of that judgmental place or we are going to perish as a race. And somebody said, hey, that's like a lot of cockroaches on the earth being gone. That's maybe not such a bad thing. I don't think that's our destiny. I don't think that's our fate. But I do agree that if we don't get above our differences, we are absolutely going to see a lot more loss than we are going to see gain in this process. Yeah, so the earth is um, an interesting 
being. It is. She can she can shake us off her back pretty quick if, if needed be. Um, we are talking to Gregory Possman. Please go to his website, gregorypossman.com. Uh, look at the different products he can provide you as well as uh, check out his blog and dig around it's even look for his book future vision a spiritual guide to the new millennium which we didn't talk about uh but we will we're going to have you back we'll have to talk about that before we go because i know it's 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 been a while you've been on here and we we i'd love to um i'd love you if you could open up and do a channeling and I have no idea how to do that. So it's really fascinating to me. Well, I, I close my eyes and they're here. So let's do it. Here we go. We are the one who is called Michael. Some call us Mikael. You can call us whatever you like. We are the one who is called the Archangel. It is a joy, a pleasure, and a great honor to be with you. We would ask you to breathe and to open to the divine aspect of yourself. Perhaps it is best if we answer questions what question would you put to us? We are curious. Just as are you curious. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, am I on path? You are absolutely on your path, and you pointed out the irony of your situation earlier in this broadcast. You said as a child you were very inwardly bound. In other words, you would not even answer the telephone if there were no one else in the house. And now you are speaking to hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people. And you are expressing some of your innermost, most intimate secrets and beliefs. Do you not find that somewhat ironic? <laughs> yes, very ironic. So, uh, I've I have been told, Michael, that you are very, uh, you and I are very connected. Um, why do you imagine we are the one you are talking to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, because I have two two Michael tattoos, actually one. Uh, on my left arm from about 150 AD and the other one from an angel communicator from about five years ago uh, right above a tattoo that says no no end K-N-O-W no end because there is no end oh, um, it, it, it's I was told that I was off contract and I've been trying to work my way around getting back on that contract and that's what I am still, my confusion is. Think about a tree. A tree has branches, and in each of those branches, there's a kind of fork. And you can take the left fork, the right fork, or the center fork. In other words, you can go up any branch you want to go. Life is a series of eliminations. It is also a series of choices. So... One might say, well, it's imperfect that you are off of your contract. And an entity like us would say, no, it is absolute perfection. So what is the consequence? Because that is the question that is most important. What is the consequence of being off contract? Now, we did not answer your question that you are or you are not off of your contract. You already answered that question when you asked the question. <laughs> Think about it. The answer to your question is in your question. What, uh. difference, what difference does it make if you are on your contract or off of it? Given that there is no end as you have tattooed on your arm, does it matter how much time it takes for you to get back on your contract? Does it matter how much time you take off of your contract? Someone perceives that it does. We don't. 
We don't think it makes any difference one way or the other. As a matter of fact, our question would be, what have you learned while you were off your contract? And that too is perfect. Yeah, I had a, a being come through and was concerned that I was off contract. Um, and I don't recall his name. Uh, and I don't know if it wasn't an elemental being. I believe it was an ancient came through. So and let's I, ask you I, this question. What did you reflect for that being? You reflected well, in an experience of negativity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. In other words, was he commenting on your experience or was he commenting on his experience? He did oh. not want you to see the mistake that he made, and therefore he did not want you making the same mistake. And those are his words, not ours. I see. In other words, you did not make a mistake, because in truth, everything that happens on this planet and everything that happens in your life is perfect. Excuse me, man. Was it perfect from his perspective? Not necessarily. So, in his desire to guide you as he saw fit, he was telling you that you were off of your contract. We would have said to you, and so what? So what? How many times did we go off of our contracts, plural? Ten times, fifty times, a hundred times? What difference does it make? Do, uh, if I may, um, I was involved in an incident here last year. We had a number of beings um, in a room in this location that came through a um, portal and we cleared them. Some were human who hadn't crossed that came here to cross and some were beings um, uh, that I'm not familiar with. Uh, could you tell me if they are uh, existing in a, in a better place now? Because I, I was always hoping that they had moved on to something higher than here. Absolutely. And the truth of the matter is Whatever it is that they felt they might have been stuck in, they are no longer stuck in that place. In other words, their evolutionary path has continued. They are learning more in other dimensions than they could in the dimensions they were in. The portal is created by the presence of those who are sensitive to their situation. So, why do you imagine, think about this for a moment, why do these programs where they try to record ghosts and spirits, why do they annoy you? They annoy you because they're not being respected. In other words, those entities are being disturbed, perhaps they are being insulted, perhaps they are being riled up, as you might say, but they're not necessarily being respected and all entities deserve respect. Because you respected the entities in the place that you mention, first of all, they all gathered. Second of all, they all benefited from your compassion, acknowledgement, and respect. And third, decided that because many of them had chosen to move on, the rest might move on as a group. You talked about the presence of groups. Mm -hmm. Vibrational okay. frequencies attract one another, and therefore those frequencies that have not moved on easily find others. I had a, um, I, I guess the best term for it would be a, a regression where I saw myself not of this planet. I also saw myself as my primary spirit guide. Was I seeing correctly? 
Absolutely. So many of you on this planet are what are called hybrids. And the hybrids are those who have lived in other life forms, be they extraterrestrial or otherwise. And unlike what you call the Hindu belief that you must evolve in a certain form or matter, we disagree. In other words, in your next incarnation, if there is one, you will come into a place, a dimension, a reality, where you will learn whatever lesson you didn't learn in this lifetime. And it doesn't make any difference what life form you take on. So if you are an extraterrestrial in the next life, so be it, that is perfect. If you are an earthling, a human, so to speak, so be it. If you decide to become an earthworm so you can learn something else, that is wonderful. It takes nothing away from whatever life form you choose to be in order to complete your path of evolution. We did not say contract, we said path. That, uh, that is important. On my next, if everything goes as planned on path in this <laughs> incarnation, <laughs> am I moving to a next the next dimension in my next uh, in, in in my next incarnation yes and am i no. moving up yes and no because you see you've juxtaposed it as up uh, it's not up or down or sideways it's not any of those it is actually whatever step is necessary in terms of your evolution that is the key now, because you are in a human body and because you believe in the aspect of vibrational frequency moving up, that is why you use the term up. But to oh, us, see. it is not up, down or otherwise. It is simply moving on. That would be more accurate from our perspective. Moving on. <laughs> uh, question of February... 2022 is an event going to occur that you and yours your realm will step a step back from and let happen that remains to be seen and the reason that we cannot answer your question is because the answer has not been determined someone is pinpointing that particular date and time, it will depend entirely on the conscious level of humanity. In other words, humanity's ability to raise its consciousness. The event will or will not happen based upon that. And let us draw a quick analogy. Many of your politicians are making their decisions based on the science of how many are contracting this disease? Many of them are not. If you think of consciousness very similar to the number of those contracting the, the virus, that is what we might call science. We will make the decision based upon where that consciousness lies at that point in time. So there are those who would predict it will take place, and there are those who can't predict whether it will take place. The truth is it will be based upon humanity's conscious awareness at that time. And for those who I've spoken to who have seen vision of the event, and uh, were they provided that information to take it as a warning to mankind? Absolutely. Because what is prophecy? Prophecy is a point of attention. In other words, the, the world will end in the year 2000. The world will end in the year 2012. It will end in the year 2022. Why would such a prophecy be offered to people? It would be offered to people so that it doesn't happen. In other words, okay. it will draw their attention to the opposite 
they will focus on the opposite. As you call it, the law of attraction will set in. So, for those who predict another ice age on your planet, <laughs> why would you need another ice age on this planet? To kill everything that exists? To wipe out all of the process that has taken place, all of the progress, all of the process, all of the procedure? Or is it that you would offer that as a prophecy so that humanity can say, wait a minute, perhaps it is important for us to focus on something much better. Perhaps we learn how to get along with one another. Perhaps we learn how much unconditional love is inside of each of us and we start showing everyone else what that looks like. Now, that's called the morphic field. And the morphic field has been described also as the field around your physical body. So, when you begin to think in terms of the morphic field instead of the terms of physicality, you begin to change the field around you. Oh, interesting. So we're, again, the law of attraction, we attract the, we're going to attract the positive. Absolutely. What has happened during the course of this virus? Weapons sold, ammunition sold, and then the form or the statement rather that says those who live by the sword die by the sword so what do you have you have a frequency of people who believe they must defend themselves and what happens they break out their weapons and they begin defending themselves but an entity such as yourself what happens to him one who is extremely familiar with weapons but on the other hand, doesn't necessarily believe in the use of them. He never is confronted by one with a weapon. Why? Because the morphic field around him is filled with unconditional love. It is filled with non-judgment. It is filled with a very different kind of energy. Yeah. I, one of the things I've always thought about you was not allowing me to knock on a door once and <laughs> let us tell you our friend if you're going to knock on a door you better be prepared for what's on the other side yeah and i had no idea why i was drawn away from the home and a couple of doors down and went off on this little training thing in my head and it just in high, of course in hindsight when you replay the tape <laughs> kind of thing you look at it and go oh yeah that i wonder why i didn't do that everyone else I'd, i work with would have actually pulled in the driveway and knocked on the door and i didn't i did something completely different so i always kind of looked at that as something um outside of what i perceived my control but i guess i was in control but it was pointed out to me that no 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 michael's there you were paying attention to your intuition. And your intuition yeah. said, not today, not this doorway, not today. For very now, I, reason. I know you've been a little hard on me because the way I ride my motorcycle. Um, because that's been, <laughs> that's been, um, that has been pointed out to me before by other people who you had talked to. Uh, <laughs> where I, and for, for my listener, what I do is I, I use Palo Santo to clear my motorcycle. I, I, I re humbly request that Michael clear a path in front of me, behind me, and on the sides that elemental beings, um, I'm not interfering with them as I'm traveling and that I don't interfere with anybody else. And and then I did, uh, somebody came forward and said, Michael just told me that he's having a hard time <laughs> trying to keep you safe. And I went, okay, I'll, I'll calm down. Let um, ask you but, a question. Uh, you what's that? For the interruption, let us ask you a question. Do you know how many deer you have not hit as a result of the protection <laughs> yeah. around you? Uh, Maybe that's many. the answer to your question. Yes, many. Yes, I could. I could see that. Uh, the uh, I 
it, it's fascinating, and I know that I'll have more questions after after <laughs> but right now i'm just i'm like a kid in the candy store saying okay which one do you want <laughs> I, have, I have all these confections now which one would you like and i was like no i don't i can't i can't choose i can't make up my mind it's i am i am honored to have a chat with you this is this is actually um a highlight of my path we will and take, I we will take everything that you have taught us back to the others and we ask you to remember one thing. All of this communication, education, evolution, it all goes two ways. We are learning as much from you being a human being as you are learning from us being what we are. So do not forget that. Do not forget. And Thank by you. the way, we are a very powerful angel and the truth of the matter is we can protect you from a lot of things on your motorcycle, just like we protect the man through whom we speak on his. <laughs> <laughs> we will give him his body back. It has been an honor and a great pleasure. We are Thank you. called Mikael. We are grateful. So be it. I'm back. Have a drink of water. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, now, when you channeled, do you remember what came through? Bits and pieces. Um, words. I heard the yeah. word here. I also heard the word motorcycle. <laughs> yes, that was related to you, too. Oh, okay. I because uh, do you, you have a motorcycle? I do, indeed. I do. Yes, it, Michael was saying he looks after me and he looks after you uh, on the bike. The uh, Yeah, when I, I, my friend Skeeter who channels, um, afterwards she'll just stare at me and with sometimes with tears in her eyes like saying, I have no idea what happened. And I'd say, yeah, well, I had a good conversation with somebody not of this world. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she, but at the beginning, uh, are you, I, I want to thank you very much. That was, very that was actually really very cool. And I wish uh, the Archangel Michael came through and I, um, I, I was one of those things that in the next hour or so I'll have a list of questions a mile long yeah. but right at the time it was like he said yeah ask me anything <laughs> like what You're like damn lottery numbers that's it I should have asked that <laughs> um, but it was the uh, yeah it, it was fascinating and um, it's yeah I, I, I'm kind of uh, tongue tied now but um, it's it, it, do, do you after this what are your emotions like? What is, what is it your your heart rate at? What is like? Tell me physically what you're going through. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. I am coming back into my body. It doesn't take very long. Uh, probably another minute or so. The longer I stay out, the longer it takes to get back. That was not very long, so that's not a problem. Um, emotionally, it's, uh, it's almost like a drug. It's kind of an addiction. I love doing it. Um, when I don't do it for a long period of time, I miss it. On the other hand, it is, uh, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I tell people it's like brushing my teeth. I mean, I do it so often and I've done it for such a long period of time. It feels like a very natural thing. It did not feel that way in the beginning. But uh, if I were to do it 10 minutes from now, it would be just as easy. Uh, Michael is an entity that I have a lot of familiarity with and a tremendous amount of trust with. So it's very easy for me to channel Michael. Michael was one of the first entities that ever came through me. So that helps tremendously. Now, if it were a brand new entity that I hadn't channeled very often, I would probably take a little bit longer to get back into my body. I feel like Michael and I have a very, very trusting relationship. Um, I probably give more control to him in my when I'm out of my body than I would to an entity that I'm not that familiar with. 
And that's probably very difficult to describe, but that's the way it feels. Oh, interesting. It's um, he came through, and I, I kept picturing in my head a great big, you know, the old uh, the old vision, the pre Coca Cola Santa, a great big <laughs> jolly guy with a beard and a mug of beer, going ah, ha, 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 you know, just that great boist, bo- very boisterous kind of guy, not the soft angel looking guy with a sword standing on <laughs> Satan's throat kind of thing, oh, but um, yeah, very just kind of a big boisterous guy that I'd go for a beer with. He has even expressed a kind of dismay at the idea of the armor and the shield and the sword and all that and he 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 oftentimes makes fun of that he thinks that's funny um and he's oftentimes portrayed of course as a warrior and to some degree i guess there is that part of him but i feel him as a very very uh, just comical laughing very wise at the same time, but a tremendous sense of humor. It just has such a great sense of humor. And I will tell you, you know, there, that, that is a side of Michael that does come through me, but I will also relay that at, a, uh, at an expo that I did when I hadn't been doing this very long, I was doing mini sessions for people, and a woman came in and sat down, and he said to her, if you don't leave your husband, he's going to kill you. So there is a side of Michael that is very serious and very uh, protective, not just the humorous aspect, but a very, uh, uh, I mean, I was kind of blown away by that message. And, um, and I heard it when it was said. And she didn't flinch. She didn't bat an eye. She knew that she was being told the truth. And she, I, I, my feeling is that she did leave the man and that she did not die at that man's hands. Um, that session might have lasted 10 minutes, if that. So there is, there are lots of levels of these beings besides the ones that they may portray um, on a particular occasion. I guess that's what I want to say. There is a very serious side of Michael that has come through many times and done some pretty powerful teaching. So it's not just and and didn't probably didn't laugh at all during that period. So I'm I'm and and I think as we uh, those of us who channel realize that there are different levels of these entities that we tap into and that that evolves too that changes over time. So like us they have varying aspects of their personality. <laughs> Oh, it's fascinating. So I, I did um, I did run a couple of things by him in regards to a regression I had where I was went back to another planet and uh, at, through this regression I it was bizarre because back in 2012 my first event with a psychic she told me that um, my primary spirit guide looked like he was from Egypt thirty thousand years ago. And I asked his name, and she said, well, he's kind of laughing and shaking his head because we're always asking for names. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't really have one. And then she, in the conversation, she said, yeah, he's never been terrestrial before. And we just totally skipped over that. Like, totally for years, never came back on, well, in a year, about a year and a half, I guess. <laughs> and I was at a uh, event where someone took a picture, and I can't remember what it was called, like it's a Polaroid with these, and then these beings, or these energies come through on the Polaroid, and, it, and a psychic um, ET experience or shaman walked by and saw the photo, and he looked at it and said, oh, look, your spirit guide's an ET. <laughs> I looked at the picture and went, what? He goes, yeah, this big purple one right here, that's an ET. That's your spirit guide who stepped through. And I went, okay, now I know what she meant by not being terrestrial. So my primary spirit guide I knew at that point was extraterrestrial. And then in this regression in June or July of last year, I ended up seeing somebody who, and I described him at the time as basically what uh, this spirit guide had been described to me as looking like the bald guy with high cheekbones and kind of a little turned up nose. And it was me. And then I was I went to this place and sat in his chair anyway. And I realized that the person taking me through this, the channeler said the or the, the one guiding me who was channeling this regression actually said that, oh, you are your higher self. 
<laughs> but who is your higher self? Mm -hmm. And it, then it just dawned on me and said, I am not only my higher self, but my higher self is my primary spirit guide. And she said, yeah. <laughs> so it was like the snake eating its tail. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm, I'm, I am myself guiding myself, which is bizarre. But that's kind of what uh, Michael did kind of did a little bit of confirmation on that. So that was, that was kind of cool. Well, two two impressions come. One is there's an article uh, in the blogs on the website. There's an article about hybrids that I wrote to help people understand more about my understanding of that. And the second piece is I think it might have been I, I, I don't even know who suggested this, but imagine talking to yourself 20 years from now. In other words, instead of instead of thinking about going to your higher self, imagine you live 20 years from now. What wisdom would yourself come back and say, hey, think about this or that or the other? I think that quote might have come from Bill Gates, but I'm not sure. And it's been a curiosity of mine. If I live another 20 years, what would my 20 year older self advise me to do today? It's an interesting question. <laughs> oh, Lord. I always think back on, oh, I really would like to go back to high school right now with the brain that I have now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and the confidence, uh, both um, interpersonally and and uh, you know, every, everything else. I still wouldn't be able to write an essay very well. And I'm still dyslexic. But, boy, I'd have a lot of fun. You would. And uh, definitely buy a lot of stock. <laughs> Dad, buy buy this company. It's called Apple. I know you probably never heard of it, but yeah, if you got some extra money, um, yeah, it's like we always. I think that's a very human thing to go back and say, "Oh, woulda, coulda, shoulda." Right, right. If if I if I only knew that knew this twenty years ago, to, you know, honestly, Gregory, if I only knew this last Wednesday, well, you know, it, I, it's it, 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 it's. It, it's not that far back in time that I would like to go back and adjust things. You know, literally, it could be uh, yesterday at around three. It's, mm -hmm. you know, well, let's get this thing done. But now I've got to wait till the end of this incarnation. Come back, <laughs> sit down with the council going, OK, what was the list I had? Because consciously, I didn't know I had a list until later in life and I still didn't get a copy of it. So it's like, it's like we've given you a plan. Here's the master plan for your life. Go. Oh, by the way, in your life, you won't know what the plan is. Exactly. So try to, we just try to pay attention. We'll give you a little clues like hair on the back of your neck, standing up. And if you're really screwing up, we're going to shut it down. You'll come back. It's like, dude, <laughs> could I just have a list while I'm doing it? I can check it off. Um, you know, we can we can get into the Akashic records. We, I could, like I said, I can talk to you for hours. This is like this is a three beer conversation. <laughs> Plus, uh, we could keep going on and on and on. What kind of motorcycle do you have? I have a 1999 Honda Goldwing, and it's uh, basically for sale. It's too big for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I have, really? Yeah, I have a bad habit of biting off more than I can chew. And I will, I want to relay one story when Michael talked about protection. I had just bought the motorcycle. I'm going down the interstate and expressway at 74 miles an hour. My back tire blows out and I'm mm. forced off the side of the road and I end up in a ditch that's full of grass. And I was barely injured. I mean, by all rights, had I been about 50 feet further on, I'd probably been killed because there was a bridge and I'd gone over the bridge into uh, oncoming traffic. So I definitely, I was very grateful for all the protection that I received. And now I'm a little bit more cautious as I ride the motorcycle. But that was an experience. And I'd always wondered what was it like to have a flat tire on a motorcycle and I found out. Uh, so I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but uh, you know, that's, that, that was one of the experiences I had almost immediately after I bought this larger motorcycle. Okay. So, yeah, I got a, um, I traded my 2017 Harley Road Glide Limited on a 2020, and it's big. 
It must. Be. And <laughs> I, 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 but I ride from Vancouver, BC, uh, down the Oregon coast, Northern California, uh, Sturgis, South Dakota, Beautiful. going through Wyoming and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot of animals bouncing. And I always, you know, when when I talk to people about protection and saying, you know, you do, you you know, you smudge or my Palo Santo, the bike, I've got an Archangel Michael Bell hanging on it. Uh, and I consciously ask for protection. Um, some people call it praying. I call it meditation. We're still shutting our eyes and communicating with a higher being. So your meditation is somebody else's prayer. Mm -hmm. So, and the guys I go, I hang out with, they're all saying, oh, okay, you believe in that stuff? I go, yeah. And I do all my stuff and then they'll come up and go, hey, clear my bike too. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay. But, and I said, yeah, but you know, just because you think Michael or somebody's with you protecting you doesn't mean you go naked and uh, pop wheelies down Main Street. It's, it, it, it's like they're protecting you in all sorts of ways, like leading you to the store with the best helmet <laughs> it, it reminds me of that story the classic story about the uh, the christian who's in the flood and you've probably heard this one but uh, for my listener who hasn't it's uh you know the flood is coming up and a boat comes up to his the guy's house and says hey you you come with me uh, your house is going to be flooding oh no god, my god will protect me and then the flood keeps coming up and now the guy's up on the, you know, basically hanging on the edge of the roof. And another boat comes by and says, hop in, we can save you. No, no, my God will protect me. And then he's up on the roof. Flood has just about covered the entire house. A helicopter comes by and says, hop on, let's go. And he says, no, my God will protect me. And sure enough, Buddy dies, he drowns, goes up to heaven and God shows up and says, so welcome. And he says, dude, like God, um, I... I thought you were going to protect me. And God looks at him and says, send you two flipping boats and a helicopter. What else do you want me to do? <laughs> it's like we have to still do stuff to look after ourselves, but we are pointed in the direction of being safe. I think the gist so. of your of your story is pay attention. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pay attention. We're doing. We are protecting you by giving you the options to protect yourself. Absolutely. They're they're going to show up in front of you. I um I, I related a story. The Michael story I had, and my listener probably knows this one. As a policeman, I got pulled. I got called to a, a call that was not broadcast as being really urgent. So I pull up to this house, and it was snowy in northern Canada, northern Alberta. And I drive by the house and I, I needed to be in front of the house to see the address. It's the way it was, it was situated on the road. And there was a little girl looking out the front window. window, And I just kept driving. I drove two doors down, got out of the house, walked up. And I turned it in my head into a really violent kind of scene where you'd, you would know, put it myself in training mode. So I'd walk up and I was I'd kind of put my ear up against the basement window to hear yelling and screaming. I didn't hear anything. But I had taken quite a while. I had taken an extra three or four minutes from when the girl saw me drive by. And a guy came running out of the house with his shirt off, all like fists clenched, all ready to fight. And I said, hi, how are you? My, my name's Jim. I'll be your policeman today, which was very common for me to say. It would just always diffuse people. And he stopped and looked at me and burst into tears and told me about this whole thing with his ex. And she wanted him kicked out of the house and blah, 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 blah. So I went inside, grabbed his coat, said, just wait down here. Went up this long set of stairs. So it was right at the door. You come in the door and then the stairs went up. And as I'm walking up the stairs, their railing to the living room became open on my right side. And I could see her sitting in a chair. So I focused on her and there was a big butcher knife beside her. And I'm kind of focused on that. And I walk over and say, how are you doing? And I take the butcher knife and move it away. And she laughs and says, you're moving the knife. He was going to shoot you with that. And on the top of the stairs, uh, there was a, a little like dresser with a hunting rifle, a moose hunting rifle on it. And when the little girl said the cops were here, he loaded the gun and pointed it down the stairs. Oh, wow. Waiting for me to knock. But I didn't knock because I drove past the place and was taking too long. So he put the gun down and ran out. Hmm. But anyone else I worked with would have pulled in the driveway, walked up and knocked on the door. Because the call itself wasn't dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in replaying the dispatch communication with the lady calling, it sure was dangerous. And the dispatcher ended up getting fired. Wow. 
because it was a panic. He was tearing up the kitchen. He was ripping cupboards off. He was threatening to kill and blah, 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 blah. But I didn't get that information relayed to me. And it was bizarre on the phone. Her calling in, wanting to know what was going on. Like, here's my, my boyfriend's doing this, 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 this. And then the dispatcher, hey, are you doing anything? This lady like to talk to you. <laughs> It was weird. It was weird. That audio tape was transcribed and the entire file ended up being sent to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, Academy, training academy, as a uh, pay attention. But to listen to the audio called in, the dispatch, completely different. And then she called back wanting to know where I was. Oh, the lady called back, just want to know if you're coming. I said, yeah, I'm heading over. But on the second call was, where is he? He's tearing up the kitchen. It was, and and the dispatch was, yeah, she just wants to know if you're heading over. Okay, dude, <laughs> yeah, I could have been shot. I still have the bullet. Actually, the bullet that was loaded and in the gun pointing at the door, I had it on my desk in my career to remind me, A, don't pay attention to my bosses because they would have just drove in the driveway or told me to just walk up and knock on the door. And B, to just pay attention to your gut feeling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I ran that by Michael. I, just, I gave him a high five, kind of thank him on that one, because uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't. Uh, that's the reason all of a sudden I went, I had a completely different thought went on training mode. Anyway, I've kept you a long time, Gregory Possman. It's been uh, We are definitely going to have to talk uh, again, because I, I'd like to talk uh, about your books, um, this, particularly the future vision of spiritual guide to the new millennium, which people can find on your website, yes. uh, can also find on Amazon. Yes. But I would go to your website because that way the Amazonians don't take 90% of the pay. <laughs> uh, you also have a book called Wounded Healers, Reflections on a 20-year tumul- tumultuous, in that word, tumul- uh, 20 years of tumultuous membership of the Chiron Brotherhood, a men's group for male healers. Uh, that is two podcasts all in itself, I think. I would, would be. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. But I, again, I really want to thank you, Gregory, for dropping by. And it was an absolute pleasure to hear your side of this whole woo-woo stuff and how you've been living with it. And also the channeling was fantastic. Thank you. Good, good. Well, it was an honor and I look forward to doing it again whenever the opportunity arises. Watching you while you sleep on and on. All right, that's it. Let's roll. And hey, 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 hey. Let's be careful out there. Far over the snow, under the snow.